Hello, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast with Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman, where we give you insights into the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity. Each episode will feature a new guest who will stimulate your mind and give you a greater understanding of yourself, others, and the world we live in. Hopefully, we'll also provide a glimpse into human possibility. Thanks for listening and enjoy the podcast. Today's episode of the Psychology Podcast is brought to you by The Great Courses Plus. Later in the show, we're going to hear a little bit more about their library of over 8,000 streaming video lectures presented by award-winning experts. But right now, we're really excited to be speaking with our guest, Roy Baumeister. Roy is a professor at both the University of Queensland and Florida State University. He's authored more than 500 publications and has co-authored or edited almost 30 books. He is one of the most highly cited psychologists of all time. This is part two of a two-part series. You've also studied willpower. (laughs) <laughs> Another, you know, small topic. Let me just, because in the interest of time, like, can you just tell me um, one or two things people can do to increase their willpower? Because that's something that people, you know, with like goal achievement, goal attainment, the biggest thing they'll get in their way is a lack of willpower. Like, I want to go to the gym and lose weight, but that juicy cookie is right in front of me and I've lost the willpower. So what's are some strategies to increase willpower? Well, first, let me say that the glass of willpower is half full and half empty. People think a lot, and indeed the big positive psychology uh, survey on the values and stuff found that people rate self-control as one of their biggest weaknesses. Rarely does it come up as one of one's biggest strengths. So it seems to be a widespread perception that we don't have enough self-control. And in terms of reaching our ideals and being the person we want to be, yeah, more self-control would help. But we also have a lot more than other creatures. And we use it a lot. We do pretty well with what we have. So uh, I try to focus on the positive as well as the negative. So in terms of your practical question of what people can do uh, to maximize it, this is something where there's a lot of research going on and some controversies and different opinions. You know, my best guess present is that good self-control, it's not really that they have more willpower in any kind of physiological sense. They just use it more wisely and, and prudently. I had a, a big study. Uh, looking at what everyday desires and do people resist their desires and and so on. So what people with high self-control, you'd expect them to report resisting their desires more. No, they reported resisting desires less. How high is that? Well, they stay out of tempting situations. They avoid trouble. It turns out what successful people do is they develop habits and routines that get them the results that they want. Don't expose them to temptation where they need all their willpower and you talked about being at, uh, you know, wanting to go exercise and seeing some uh, tempting piece of cake or donut. I forget what you said. Cookie, uh, cookie. Cookie, cookie, okay. The person with high self-control is not going to come across the cookie. The person with high self-control, it's just it's time to exercise. And so you have a well-developed habit that you go exercise. You don't need willpower to make yourself do it. You do need it to establish the habit. But once it becomes a habit that, you know, every day it uh, 7 a.m. or 4 p.m. or whenever, I'm going to go get some exercise. And then you manage not to uh, find yourself uh, looking longingly at cookies in between. So to me, there's been a big change in how we think about self-control. It's not the heroic act of resisting temptation. Rather, it's setting up the routines and habits that will make life run smoothly in a more automatic thing so you don't need as much willpower because we don't have a great deal. In terms of your question was how to increase or strengthen or replenish or whatever, there's some evidence that it works like a muscle, that if you use self-control regularly, you get better at it, you get stronger. And there may be even some brain changes in how it stores energy and stuff like that. And then basic things, getting enough sleep and getting food to eat. The body's energy comes from food. It's one of the particular challenges of dieting because... For dieting, you need willpower. For willpower, you need energy. You need from food, so you have to eat so that you'll have the willpower to uh, resist the fattening foods. I would say you know, start and be successful. Start by eating a bunch of healthy foods, and you can tell yourself, I can have dessert later, fill up on the healthy stuff, and then that will give you maybe the strength of character to resist those. Sleep is another one. A little bit of argument about it, but to me... Uh, 
It looks like people who are sleep deprived, it looks like people with poor self control are more likely to act impulsively and get into trouble and make poor judgments. So, uh, sure. What do you say to the critics? There's some scientists who have proof challenged the ego depletion theory, saying it's not like a muscle, that that's not the mechanism. Does your research still stand up as far as you're concerned? That that is what's going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, I just went through all the uh, all the literature. And my view is just to end up knowing what's right. I I never assume I'm right. Of course, but the, you think on totality the evidence. Still yeah, the other views. So there's some great contributions that people are making, and they have excellent valid points. But mostly, it works together as an extension of the idea that there's limited willpower to replace it. There are only one or two that have seriously tried to say, let's get rid of the whole notion of limited resource. And there are just a fair number of findings. I mean, there's like so much evidence now that uh, if you want to take it seriously, you'd have to be able to account for things. You know, they, you want to pick and choose. Well, I can explain this finding without using willpower or strength. That, uh, yes, they're right. They can explain this finding and this finding and this finding. But what about these others? And challenges them to do that. And there are a lot. So just spent about two years trying to read everything and well, let's put it together. So I've changed my opinion several times and may change it again. But right now, best guess is that we still need to understand the uh, limited resource. Some of the processes are, are fairly far removed from the actual physiological expenditure of energy. That's sort of the stumbling block. But it, it turns out with physical exertion, it's the same thing. Your muscles start to feel tired long before they reach the biochemical state where they can't function. So you know, your tired, tired muscle, if you're motivated, it can still perform at the full peak level. Uh, it's just there's some kind of central system that starts to conserve energy and mm -hmm. says, well, we've, we've exerted a lot of energy, and this is not sustainable. you got to realize we evolved under different conditions. You know, there were no supermarkets in evolutionary past. Uh, you might have to go several days without anything to eat. And moreover, uh, the basic energy that goes into self-control and willpower, so it's the same energy that powers the brain and the kidney and the rest of the functions, and in particular, the immune system. The immune system uses a lot of glucose, but quite variably. Ooh, this next topic is going to sound like the worst segue ever, but what have you found is the main cause of violence and aggression? I mean, you did this terrific review paper. I believe you wrote a terrific book on this topic. A counterintuitive true cause of violence and aggression, which is different than what uh, a lot of people in the media often say. All right. Causes of aggression. This is from my book, yeah. Evil, Inside Human Violence and Cruelty. And the goal there was to understand these nasty things from the perspective of the perpetrators. There are a lot of books about evil that just say, oh, look at this awful thing this person did. You know, can you believe what this monster? But you sort of treat the perpetrator like some inhuman foreign species. I want to try it and say, I want people to read these things and be able to say, I could see myself doing that in that situation. So what I came up with there was four root causes and well, three and a half maybe, and then one proximate cause. So the root causes, first, is just a means to an end. And there's a lot of that. People do violence. People fight wars to take food and land and other resources from other people. If people commit crimes, rob people, or whatever to get their way. Second, threatened egotism, that people have a favorable view of themselves. Others question it, challenge it, disrespect them, impugn and criticize them. That seems to uh, elicit an aggressive response as you want to say, no, you shouldn't criticize me. They want to keep a, a positive view. This might be what you were referring to because there was a tradition of thinking low self-esteem led to aggression, but I sure could not find any exactly uh, any, is, is sign, right. any signs of that. And uh, it was abundantly clear that most perpetrators of violence think they're superior beings. And studies of murderers and rapists. and Skulls. Right? Uh, yes. Uh, so there's often the sense of superiority that's not being respected. I'm not getting the respect I deserve. Even terrorists and so on. Uh, governments, too, have this uh, this feeling. The third was an idealistic that, you know, we think uh, God's on our side and God's against the other people and God wants me to kill those other people. So the biggest body counts of the 20th century, we forget this, but they were produced by idealists. 
the communism, you know, they thought we're going to make the world a better place by making everyone equal, which meant killing a lot of the people who didn't fit in. And the Nazis had this utopian vision of a fair and just society where people treat each other, they just need more space, we're going to kill all the people who are in the way or who weren't with the program. It's uh, in the U.S., we don't see this as much, but like some of the people who bomb abortion clinics and so on, thinking that, well, they're killing babies in there, you know. You know to most of us, that seems evil to hide a bomb and kill some people. But to them, they're doing what's good. And, and I think this my work that's come out since then that many murderers see uh, what they're doing as upholding positive moral values and avenging a wrong. But, but even other, like serial killers? Uh, not serial killers yeah. much. More the, the impulse that this, you know, most killers are one-time thing. The serial killers are uh, probably a deranged group. And then they might fit into the fourth category, which is sadism, which is uh, right. do people actually get pleasure out of harming others? And I wrestled with that one for a long time. There were lots of you know, victims always claim, oh, yeah, they were laughing. They were enjoying it. They took pleasure in our suffering. It's hard to see much of that in the perpetrator's own accounts. But there was enough where even if they said, I don't really enjoy it, but there was someone else who said he did and, and so on. So I came to think. This is the half. Uh, it's not a real root. The, you know, people are born sadists. Uh, there may be a few, but it's not a major source of violence. But some people can let themselves start to enjoy killing others or performing harm to others. And so then they take pleasure in inflicting uh, harm on others. And to me, that's secondary. They often may be initially motivated by one or the other, three basic motives. But as they do it, they start to uh, you know, get some pleasure out of it. The proximal cause, is so those are the beginnings of violence, the roots. But it also struck me that the, the last link in the chain between all these things and the actual doing it is self-control, that most people use, have violent impulses now and then, but they restrain them. And so a breakdown in self-control is often uh, the immediate cause of violence. So things like alcohol or extreme emotion or provocation. These are things that will overcome one's natural inhibitions against hurting another person and allow people to get carried away. And However, there are clearly individual differences. Not oh, yes. everyone who loses their cognitive control goes and kills someone. Absolutely right. Um, so there's a combination of individual differences and societal variables. Yes. That yes. Yep. Just one second, Roy. So as we mentioned earlier, to keep this content free, we ask that you please support today's sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. We're pleased to get to offer our listeners a free trial membership to their video library. So if you like the description you're about to hear, you can give them a try at our exclusive web link, which is thegreatcoursesplus.com slash psych, and sign up there. Here at the Psychology Podcast, we're always looking for innovative ways to keep our minds stimulated and to continue with our goals for lifelong learning. So we were thrilled recently to get to try out the Great Courses Plus online video courses. Through their website, we gained unlimited access to stream over 8,000 engaging video lectures presented by award-winning experts on a vast array of topics, ranging from history, art, and philosophy, to music, personal development, and of course, psychology. They've been producing these courses for over 25 years now, and it shows they have some very high-quality content that you can watch whenever you'd like. The featured course for today's episode is titled Understanding the Mysteries of Human Behavior. It features social psychologist Mark Leary as he explores our everyday behaviors from a scientific standpoint. It's kind of like an owner's manual to the human psyche that addresses many of the puzzling questions we have about ourselves and others. The video discusses some well-respected research on the myths of happiness, how it actually works, and provides some insights into how we can become happier. It turns out that's not that we need a faster car or another million dollars in the bank to become happy. It has more to do with meaningful pursuits and how we approach them. Excitingly, you can go watch this lecture and thousands more right now through our exclusive free trial offer. You can access that by signing up at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash psych. Now back to the show. So why did you write the book, Is There Anything Good About Men? Well, for me, uh, my grand intellectual plan was to uh move from my book on human nature to write another book on free will and understand that problem. So in between, I wanted to understand how culture, which is not a physical thing, can influence behavior, which is a physical thing. So I thought, well, let's look at how culture uses one gender 
And, and, and for that, it could have picked either men or women. But there are already a ton of books about how culture exploits and takes advantage of women. So I thought oh, it would be a little more interesting and different to look at how culture uh, uses men. There's some interest there. Uh, since the 70s, there have been two dominant themes about people who write about gender. One is that women are just superior to men. And the other is that there's no difference. The no difference one has its advocates, but seemed less plausible to me. But it also didn't seem plausible that women would just be better across the board than men. I believe in trade-offs. I don't know why nature would make one gender superior to the other in all respects. But nature will preserve differences when there's a trade-off, when one thing's better for one thing and one thing better for another. So, you know, if you're a man, you read the gender research, you just notice that the men are never allowed to win. You know, you, whatever your finding is, you can say, it's fine to say women are better than men, but or to say there's no difference. But there are almost no studies uh, are coming out saying that men are better than women at this or that. So, well, they're, they're, what about there's... spatial visualization research? Yeah, they'll, they'll sometimes concede that, but uh, it's not a, in terms of socially meaningful, interesting stuff. Uh, gotcha. There's very little there, and it's a, it's a strong bias in the literature. So I had, I had gotten thinking about men. I had this big article called The Need to Belong, arguing that one of the basic human motives is this desire to connect with others. It goes back to the theme of my career that we evolved to uh, you know, participate in social systems and relationships and so on. As a paper submitted that I got sent to me to review, uh, saying that, well, mainly women have the need to belong, that men aren't as social as women. And they, they made a pretty thorough case, but well, they're just looking at being social in terms of one-to-one -one relationships. And maybe women are a little bit more attuned to that. But if you look at large groups and social systems, those are almost all things that men do more than women. Men care more about big groups and their position in social hierarchy or stuff like that. So you make a case men are more social there. That got me thinking, well, society uses men and women in different ways, consistent with the trade-off idea. So you start to look at the you know, different patterns. Um, so what, emotional expressiveness is one of the basic gender differences. Women express their feelings a lot more. So it's easy to say, well, you see, women are more social. They'll express their feelings to others and, and share them and then keep them hidden. But, okay, it's better to express your feelings in a one-to-one -one relationship because then your partner knows what you're feeling and can take care of you and do more for you and so on. But in a large group, showing all your feelings is risky. You've got rivals, you've got enemies, you've got coalitions. Maybe you're trying to buy a used car. And you say, oh, I love it. I've got to have it. Well, you're not going to get as good a deal as if you say, well, maybe. So the male pattern over and over is more evolved toward what's functional in large groups and the female pattern more toward intimate relationships. That's why throughout history, women are very strong getting into our close intimate relationships and developing the skills and very good at that and so on. But, you know, you look through history, what have large groups of women done, whereas you know, compared to large groups of men is almost the mainstay of history. So that made me start thinking uh, that there are trade-offs and men and women are good at different things, molded by nature for somewhat different tasks different and uh, if you want to say either gender is inherently superior they're just different but equal which is a theory that the field had never really uh, entertained seriously so do we have free will yes uh, the answer to the free will question is a definition question i started with defining the self the people arguing about free will are usually using quite different definitions and so the arguments they're talking past each other and it's kind of frustrating so the answer when you say, do we have free will, it depends on which definition you use. I mean, from where I sit, there are several definitions by which, yes, we do have free will. But for people uh, to whom that free will means you have to have a soul that causes behavior without a physical process, or that you're exempt from the rules of natural causality or something like that, that those seem preposterous to me. Uh, right. My goal has been to develop a scientific theory, which is natural and causal. But clearly, some actions are freer than others, and people make choices. So to me, it's can you do differently in the same situation? And that's the foundation of a lot of social life, including pretty much all moral judgment. I mean, the moral judgment says, should you have done something else in that situation? Which Or could is, you? Yeah. 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 The question of whether you should have done something else presupposes that you could have. Yes, yes, yeah. And you would say, yes, you could. 
right? I mean, you, you could have yeah. steered your consciousness in a different direction, right? Yes. Yeah. So that's a topic. We'll table that topic for another day. <laughs> All right. That's a good one. So you said you resonated with a colleague who once remarked that my whole life is sort of an avoidance response to boredom. Is there a coherent, integrative theme to all of your work, Roy? Well, now you're asking an embarrassing question. Uh, we're supposed to have one theme, and I... Uh, no, you I, said there's no higher meaning. <laughs> I try to pretend there is. Uh, I'm sort of curious about why we're here and what is the human condition and the project? Why are we doing what we're doing? So I'm trying to get all the different pieces of that, and I've moved around and started doing literature views more than collecting my own data. I've looked at the different areas, I've looked at uh, self and identity and meaning of life, self-control and social roles. I looked at evil and violence and sexuality and gender differences and culture. So I give myself 50-50 uh, chances to uh, uh, kind of have it all figured out before I drop dead. I think so. Uh -huh. I mean, <laughs> you've covered uh, the greatest hits of humanity, <laughs> so well, to speak. That's my goal. And you know, the conventional advice to make your career is you should pick one thing and make that your specialty and stick with it. And, and that's what works best for the system. And it's just hard on an individual. You get bored doing the same thing. I see people who pick one topic and study it for 20 years, and you know, they make a major contribution that way, and you can get the grants and the uh, awards and, and so on. But then eventually you just kind of run out of ideas on that and uh, brings difficulty uh, for those people. I've always done multiple different things. And so for me, uh, taking up something new is not such a big issue or challenge. And the other thing is that most social science careers are based on collecting data, and that's it. So you develop your skills to study some topic, and you keep studying that topic, integrating into broader and broader schemes, not really part of that, except you know, as you refine your theory or whatever it is you devoted your career to. But as a literature reviewer, you can combine lots of different things. And so it's more possible to come together with bigger, more integrative understanding. So I'm still hoping, you know, still looking for a few other pieces of the puzzle and then hoping I can put together the puzzle to come up with something new. The meaning of humanity. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> I love it. Are there any topics we, did, we didn't cover today that you want to, anything you're working on more recently that you definitely wanted to talk about? No, um, the, this has been fun and uh, I'm sure there are more interesting things going on now, but uh, the, it's, that's always true. This, I think we've... Uh, covered a lot of ground, and I hope your listeners are getting a, get a kick out of this. Cool. They have the patience to make it to the end. Yes, I think we're going to split this up into two sections, actually, two parts. Okay, good. Uh, thank you for such a wide-ranging, fascinating, I say cheekily uplifting, because <laughs> it wasn't really always uplifting, but it was a hopefully elucidating to people discussion. Thank you so much, Roy. Okay, Scott, thank you. Take care. I'll talk to you again soon. Again, this episode was sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. Sign up for free access to their video library at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash psych. Thanks for listening to the Psychology Podcast with Dr. Scott Barry Kaufman. I hope you found this episode just as thought-provoking and interesting as I did. If you'd like to read the show notes for this episode or hear past episodes, you can visit thepsychologypodcast.com. Psychology Podcast.